So um, I've had a look back in time when the last time was that I talked about debugging and it's been a while. And this is because debugging, teaching about debugging is harder than teaching about other things. And other things you can usually say, oh, do this, do that, do this, and then you get your results. But with debugging, unfortunately, there is no specific scheme X that you can just that we can just tell you to do and say do this do this do this and then you will find your bug and then you go back instead it's um it's a little bit more of an art form so you have to be a little bit creative and stuff um but there are certain things that help and this is um this is this is two there are two prong the first thing what we're going to do is um and we're talking a little bit about why programs fail in the first place? What kind of error message? What kind of errors happen, and how do we deal with them? And then um, there are certain tools that uh, that you can use to find out what's really going wrong. So this um, will. So I'll start with the with the first part: how programs fail. And basically, um, the failures that I've encountered always go to one of three um, one of three sec. Uh, go wrong in one of three ways. The first one is um, the one that's well, most obvious. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So it runs, it terminates, but the output is incorrect. So for example, here, I've written my super useful adder function, but when I use it, um, it's giving me the, incor the incorrect output. By the way, can you all see my, my screen well? And should I put, make it larger, smaller? Anything like that? Should have asked that in the beginning. No, that's <laughs> good. That's good. Thanks, Holger. That's good. So, um, so this is uh, this is the first thing that it, that that, it, that you can that can go wrong. The second way is a crash. So, um, in in Python, um, this usually will result in one of these um, error messages that Sam has talked about last week, but. Uh, in, in other programs, this will be a stack trace or, a, or something like that. So a very, very, very visceral, very direct um, error and abnormal program termination. And the third way is that it um, doesn't terminate at all. It will simply hang. It will stop doing anything. It will not progress. It will not produce any output. It will simply not do anything at all. Um, and the only way to solve this is literally to um, to terminate the program. So in this case, um, I can press this button up here. Um, if you have a program, you might have to press press Control Z and stuff like that, or, or so, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, are there any questions so far about um, about these? these errors, these types of errors. Okay, I don't hear any errors, any questions. Um, so by the way, the, the error is here in this line. I've tried to hide it a little bit. Um, this would have to be plus equals, then it works. Okay, so um, almost all the errors that uh, that I've encountered, all the bugs that I've encountered, fall into one of these three categories. And um, this uh, this hanging is a little bit uh, different because you might think, oh, there are different ways of how a program can hang, but almost always, or, or I, I even it's it's usually always sitting inside a, a permanent loop where it's always doing the same thing over and over and might just be that it's um that there is uh that's waiting for something to happen that doesn't happen so where it says oh has the internet has the network given me this data but has, has there any data arrived yet or something like that where we will sim simply go over and over now um Terminology. Um, we call always call it a bug. We call it um, and 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 we call it debugging. But each bug actually consists of 
three distinct um, features. And um, there is a, there's a book that I like really well. It's called Why Programs Fail. Um, and this has a kind of, that this suggests to um, distinguish between three, these three different things. They call it the defect, oops. The defect, the infection and the failure. Um, so the defect is the actual coding error. So this is where things, where, where, where there's a, an, um, an error in the, in the code or maybe in the library or in your hardware or the operating system, but the code is all we have control over. Um, so if the, if, the, if the defect is in the, in the library, what we usually what we usually say, okay, the absence of the workaround for this um, for this defect is now our defect because we cannot we cannot control the operating system we cannot control the hardware if there's some bug in there we need to work around that so and and ultimately finding this defect and fixing it that is the objective of the game. Um, an infection is a program state that is not anticipated by the by the programmer. So when an, I'll, I'll, I I will later explain a little bit, uh, give later an example about how this goes together. But basically, uh, the program state is kind of think about it um, at at any point in the program you would expect to have a certain variables to be set set to certain values um, and um, so that all together it makes sense for this program at this point in time. And an infection is where it deviates from this. Um, and not all defects cause an infection, but all infections are caused either by a defect or by a previous infections. So uh, an infection can propagate and cause other infections as well, but ultimately um, it all, at, at the beginning, there was always a defect. And then finally, there's the failure. The failure is the final observable thing that goes wrong. Um, that is the fact that we know where, where we notice something is going wrong, where the program crashes or produces incorrect results or doesn't do anything at all. So this is where we really notice what's going that that something bad happened. And um also the failure is kind of um the fact the fact that we want to avoid and this is a little bit important so um yeah so we have the situation where we have a defect in our code that when executing causes an infection which might then propagate into further infections until eventually one of these infections causes a failure and we get the wrong results or we get we get uh, undesired output and um, to, ex to explain this in an example, I have here a FISBUS. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's a very popular um, uh, coding interview question where you basically say, write me a program that um, prints a number, that, that prints numbers from one to 100, or in this case, one to 20. Um, but every time a number is divisible by three, it should print FIS instead of the number. And then time it's divisible by five, it should print BUS instead of the number, and if it's divisible by both, it should print FISBUS. And so I've created here a little function that um, takes a number and returns the, 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 the value. And then I'm, I'm running this here. And you can see there's the output and um, this is all correct, except for this line here. 15 is divisible by both five and three. So it, it, should, have, it should have written FISBUS instead of FIS. And this is this is uh, important because the defect the defect was there for all of these for all of these um, uh, these iterations, but it only really um, culminated in a in a failure in one of these situations. So um, we have to now to figure out what went wrong. We basically have to trace back um, from the failure 
to the original, de through all the infections, to the original defect. And this is the this is the tricky part because programs generally don't don't run in reverse. Um, so this is this is the tricky bit. Are there any questions about this distinction between uh, defect uh, infection and failure? Okay. Everyone's still with me. Or did my internet go down? No. Okay. So, okay. Now that we've that now that we've discussed a little bit about what a bug is and how the different parts of the of the bug interact with each other, let's let's go at the tools. The first one is um, well, read the error message. Um, this goes very much into um, so here I have. Um, a few nested functions that basically just call one after each other. And um, Sam talked a lot about this last week, so I'm not going to rehash most of this. But if you get an error message, and Python is really is actually pretty good at with error messages, um, you can get a lot of things. Um, you, you can already get a lot of things. So we see here that. Uh, we try to append to something that was an integer. Um, and uh, you can always see here where it happened um, in this thing. So again, we talked last week about it, so I'm not going to go too much detail there, but this is this is really your first your first idea. Just read the read the error message, try to see um, if you can understand what it does. and um, and then we we go we go through this. And then the second one, the second tool, and that's also something with, that I'm sure you have used and I use regularly, simply put print statements in there. So in this case, um, I just created these, these things, uh, these functions again, because I'm very uh, creative. I'm calling them one, two, and three again. And um, I put these print statements in there. Now there's nothing wrong with these print statements you can very easily under, just it's it's very quick to do um it's very easy to see how the program progresses through the different stages to see if it does something um unexpected um what i like to do with these f strings i know if you 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 would know that if you put some if you put an expression into the curly braces it will <laughs> It will print out the value of that uh, the value of that expression. So if you just have n, it will just print the number. But if you put an um, an equal sign behind it, it will then um, write it down like this, where it says the expression equals and then the value of that expression. So um, should even do this. So two times n equals four. Um, so this is this is actually quite quite useful. Not not many people use it. But there's nothing there's nothing wrong with this. If you have um, a reasonably if you have a um, if you have a reasonable idea about what's going on, if you have a small pro small script, um, you this might be perfectly reasonable to just do and see what how the program progresses, and then usually you find out where something goes wrong. Um, any questions about this? Um, yeah, hi, Holger. I just have a, a question about using print statements. Yeah. Is there a nice way to get that output when we've submitted our Python script um, to the PBS queue and it's running um, running in console mode? Obviously, notebooks are really um, really handy to get the printed output. But, yeah, what if we've submitted it as a job? When you submit it as a job, um, it should get into the into the O file. So if you um, let me see, I would have to. All of that. Uh, user guide. Got a user guide. 
PBS jobs, PBS directories explained. So we have this uh, PBS minus O, the path yep. of the jobs output log. And basically everything you print in your Python script will be go will go to standard out. And with this PBS minus O this, it will redirect this output to whatever file. But usually what you do if you if you submit something, it has a default output file, which usually has is the name of your job dot O and then a number. Yep. And this is where you print state where your printing print statements yep. will end up. And I suppose every time you do that, you have to wait until your job is run in the queue and then you get that file at the end. Yeah, you have to wait until the job is finished. Yep. Yes. So I suppose that's one of the reasons why the notebook um environment is really nice for testing code and yeah. I mean in theory, you could um, run it in an interactive job, and then you can look at it while it's happening. But uh, yeah, normally you would the output gets collated and only stored at the end after the job has con concluded. You, you can also do that for non-interactive jobs, but it's a bit trickier. Okay, it is possible. It is possible if you really want to <laughs> send us a question. If you really want to, you can. I will tell you all all about it in a future yep. uh, session. Okay, okay, thank you. Good. So next, um, asserts. Now, the tricky part is often the defect might occur far earlier in the program than the failure. So as I so told you before, that the um, that that the infections can propagate and, and cause sec cause secondary infections. Now not all infections cause ultimately a failure. And if your program is in production mode, you don't want the program to fall over every time it gets a little bit of a hiccup. You want to basically continue and only, but, and, and only if, if something really terrible happens, fall over. But if you're debugging, you're already looking, you, you know you have a defect and you know the defect is a, pro is a problem. So what you then want to do is try to make the program fall over as early as possible, because that way the distance between the defect and the and the failure gets closer and closer together, and that's what the assert statement does. So um, let me quickly take this out. Um, so I've, I've again I've written a little bit of a script here, and uh, people who can who know a little bit about the input function will already know where this go where this is going. But basically, I'm um, I'm asking for a number and then I'll increment it twice. And then I say, okay, the new number is X. But if I type something in here, it now says, oh, there's something in here. So, um, and this thing. And the assert statement is basically meant for the, for the, for the, for the um, program to say, this expression should evaluate to true and if, if it isn't true, then something has gone wrong. So in here, I would do something like that. Assert type n is int, and then I can even give it a message. And if I do this now, you will see that it immediately fell, fell over at, a, at this assert and um, with this assertion error and say, okay, so this is, um, this failed. Um, and so uh, it, it fell over earlier than it was before. And then I can say, ah, yeah, input of course gives me, a, gives me back a string, not an int. And now it's, uh, it works. Um, Generally, with asserts, you want to use them in such a way. Um, so that there are there are three types where you want to use an assert. The first, the first one is where you um, have preconditions. So you want to ensure that the input to your function is same. So, for example, um, if you have something where where your where your function has takes two lists or arrays as input, but they need to be the same size. 
because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Now that may that may makes makes a um, that may that makes sense. So if you have something like assert uh, x len x equals len y. Uh, So something like that makes sense. Um, so th these are called preconditions. So um, this might be something that you might want to, uh, you want to use an assert for. Generally, you want to uh, the, the second one is uh, post conditions. So you want to make sure that at the end of your uh, at the end of your method, it's still in a sane state. So it hasn't um, it hasn't left some the, that you want to make sure that files are closed or things like that. And then the third way to use an assert is to make sure that cer certain values that shouldn't change haven't changed. So um, you would usually do that at the beginning of your function, you make a copy of the data, and then at the end, you, you verify that the same that the data is still the same. Now, asserts should be written in such, should be used in such a way that if the program is doing what it's supposed to do, the assert should always be true. Um, so basically, if you, it should be in such a way that if you take out all the asserts, the program would work exactly the same. Um, if you are worried about certain things like, um, let's say, uh, you want to read from a file, but what happens when if the file isn't there, then um, that would be more for a that would be more for a for an exception. That would uh, exception feature. So of course, asserts can be can, can be caught with with as well. But I'm going to too much detail. Any questions about that so far? No. Okay. Um, then the next one in my list is the debugger, and the debugger is quite a complex system that basically allows you to go through your code while it's executing, stop it, inspect certain things, and gives you a lot of power. But maybe we've gone far enough for today. And maybe we'll leave that for next week. How how do you feel about that? Um, it's more up to you, Olger, if no one's got questions. No, one's, um, no, one's, no one has ever, any question here, yeah? right? So I've kind of thought, okay, I'm going to talk about at half an hour at most, and that's kind of over. We're now roughly at half an hour. Um, yeah, I'm... It's about if you're ready to keep on going, you might as well go on a little bit. It's okay. just about... Let, let, let's go for a little bit of a... Look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the debugger, just the little bit that I've prepared here, but there is, um, and then um, everyone was going to try it out for themselves for a week. And the next week you will come back and ask me all the questions about how do I do X and Y, okay? Okay. Sounds great. So the debugger, um, there are various different debuggers. But um, the Jupyter Notebook has a very nice one here um, implemented itself. So if you click on this little bug item up here, now if that doesn't exist, then um, your kernel doesn't support it. But I, I've always had it there. You press it like that, and you can immediately see something happen. So first up, you can see that all the all the line tools, uh, the line numbers get highlighted. And you get you see that this piece at the at the side came out. And so what you can and, and if I if I hover my mouse over that, you can see that there's a red dot appearing underneath underneath this. So I have created this um this little function based on the Colas conjecture. I don't know if you know it. Basically, it says that if you um 
have a number and if it number is even, you halve it. And if the number is odd, you multiply it by three and then add one. And um, if you keep iterating over this, eventually you will always reach one. And then four to one, four to one, four to one. And so I basically, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of, so I can I can execute this here um, to, to save this collars connection. And now I can say, uh, I can put um, a break, break point in here. For example, let's let, put a break point in here. So I have it over here and click the mouse. And now you can see that I, I got the break point here. And um, when I now execute this line, it will execute, it, it will do everything until it reaches this line and then it will be paused. So you see it's already printed out the 395. So 395 printed. And then um, up here in the variables, it has uh, it has the N3 is 395. And it's now highlighting this, this line of code. And then I can say, okay, what do I want to do next? So this, this would be the next line to be executed. So I can, I basically have uh, here in this, here over here, I have my options, what I can do. I can press this, that means just, okay, I keep running. And it will keep running until it reaches another breakpoint. By the way, I can I can put more breakpoints. Uh, I can always add it more, uh, add more breakpoints. So if now it has, because I've clicked on this button, it has continued running until it reached the breakpoint again. So now you can see that it has printed out the next number. It has said that n is uh, 1186, um, which is three times 395 plus one. And um, I can do this more. And I can do this a few more times. And every time it reaches this breakpoint, it will pause again. And will always give me um, all the variables that are defined in there. Now, if I press this button, it will basically just abort the program. So I'm not going to do this right now because it's boring. Um, but if you basically, if you have found what you want to know, then you might just press this button and say, okay, I know what I want to do. This one basically means execute this next statement and, um, and do the next thing. So if I do this, it has uh, executed this. So N has changed again to 334. And um, it's now again on the line where it checks whether n is still larger than one. Um, I can do this again. I can do this again. And this is basically, it just keeps make do the next line of code. But I can also press, press this. And this means if there is a call to a different function, go into this different function. So if I press this button, it now, you can see that, that it has now jumped into this um, into this collars function. You can see that the call stack here has expanded. So before we just had this, now we have the we have another stack on top of that with its own variable. Well, it's it it's the same value, but the n is two fifty one is still is defined there. And I can I can now go in over here. So it says, um, and uh, if if n is even, um, do this, otherwise this. So it will now go to 251. And if I now go back, it, it comes back to here. So it has printed the next number and, um, and it checks again whether this is going. So if I go back in here, I can also say, ah, oh, no, I didn't want to go in here. I want to go back out. So this basically means continue continue this function call uh, until it's end and, and just go back to where, where you were above. So I've this, this has now concluded and um, we got the next n uh, down here. Let me go in here again. Sorry. In here. Um, if I want to figure out certain things, for example, I want to um, make changes. So at, at the moment, n is 377. Before I check whether this whether this is, e is even, n is 377. I can also click on here and basically execute random code. 
I can say print n and, and uh, modulo two, and so it just printed um, printed this one down here. Or I can um, even modify values. I can say n is three seventy eight. Oops. Evaluate. So you can see that now n has changed to. I can see that three n has been changed to three seventy eight, and as you can see now, if I go through here, where do I not? Oh, I'm sorry. Sir. There's something weird going on. Ah, yeah, I think why because I accidentally modified the. Let me quickly do it again. So, go in here. Um. So now at the moment, three n is three ninety five, but what I can do is I can change this to n equals four, evaluate, and now n is four, and n is n n n four modular two is is um even. So now it goes and returns n divided by two. And so I can even I can even go um to specific I can basically by changing these values, I can go to specific um I can create certain um, conditions that I want to investigate, even if the if the values just don't happen to be this way. Um, <clears throat> so these are gen debuggers. There are various debuggers out there, um, but these things continue. So work the, these breakpoints run until the next breakpoint, terminate the program. Execute the next line of code, go into the sub, go into um, the function, or go out of the function. These are all you you will find them in every in any debugger out there. Um, and with this, I suspect you have uh, this is a little bit the. Um, the most complex part of debugging, and there, there's a lot of talk about, but uh, let's quickly ask whether you have any questions. <laughs>